British troops helping to keep the peace in the most troubled part of the world. Cost £253 million a year. This defence role east of Suez is constantly under fire. Tonight, the view from Singapore, uncertain outpost. Bases are aggressive and they threaten the whole region. We want peace and if peace is to be maintained and defended, then all bases must be abolished. It costs a lot of money uh, to put up any form of defense in this country. Therefore, we have to depend on foreign help. I've been left in no doubt that we, in play, we play a very important role, which furthermore, I don't think anybody else could do. The Americans, of course, are uh, getting ready to replace the British in this region. I wouldn't view an American substitution for the British presence with uh, any enthusiasm. The small, swampy island of Singapore was taken over for Britain by Sir Stamford Raffles more than 150 years ago. He recognised its value as a trading post in one of the richest areas of the world. To the west lay India, Africa and Europe. To the east, China, Japan and the Pacific Ocean. The shortest connecting sea route was through the Malacca Straits, right past the island of Singapore. British military planners didn't recognize Singapore's strategic value until after the First World War. In 1921, work began on a naval dockyard. But Britain was already beyond the peak of her power. By the time the large and enormously expensive naval base was completed in 1938, she could no longer afford a Far East fleet powerful enough to meet the challenge of Japan. And although some defenses had been installed, Singapore was no fortress. Still, a myth persisted to be exploded by Japan in February 1942. The Japanese attack immediately exposed the weakness of Fortress Singapore. The Far East fleet was virtually wiped out in the first days of fighting. The Royal Air Force was equally ill-equipped. The Japanese soon established aerial superiority. It was only on the ground that the defending forces outnumbered the Japanese in manpower and equipment. But the defenders were thrown into confusion by the unexpected assault down the Malayan Peninsula, which took Singapore from the rear. The island held out for a fortnight. The inevitable surrender was the greatest humiliation in British military history. Observer correspondent Dennis Bloodworth. This may appear to indicate that Singapore has been Britain's greatest military white elephant ever. However, while this may be true of it as a fortress, it is not necessarily true of it as a depot. After the war, it was proved that as a depot, Singapore could serve considerable purposes under modern conditions. The most considerable purpose was the defeat of confrontation, the Indonesian challenge to the independent federation of Malaysia. From 1963, the Indonesians pushed raiding parties across the Borneo borders. They later tried to infiltrate into Malaya itself. 68,000 British and Commonwealth servicemen frustrated the Indonesians. Last summer, after a military coup, the Indonesian government admitted defeat. The British forces withdrew to their bases in Singapore and Malaya. Some 5,000 returned home. What lessons were learnt? Air Officer Commanding Far East Air Force, Foxley Norris. The air is the key to the matter because it does enable you, rather than keeping large garrisons, to have the Metropolitan Base Force out here in a hurry. Army Commander, Lieutenant General Sir Michael Carver. The sort of job we can do, and, and do quite well, is what we've just been doing uh, over in Borneo. The Far East Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Sir Frank Twiss. All three services are bound to be involved all at the same time. So that the Navy's role will be part uh, of any kind of of operation with both the Army and with the Air Force. During confrontation, the Navy played a very considerable part and its particular part, I suppose, was first of all dominating the scene. 
the fleet dominated the seas here and gave us complete free transit by sea and well over 95% of our stores, of course, went by sea. And we patrolled a great deal, uh, very intensively here, to prevent interference with the flanks of our troops in Borneo and interference and landing, sabotage and seaborne attacks uh, on the Malayan Peninsula. And for this purpose, we reinforced the fleet. And we particularly reinforced it with a, a very increased number of small uh, patrol craft, minesweepers, and so on. The fleet is now back to a pre-confrontation uh, level. And so far as I know, there are, is no uh, question of cutting down finances or the facilities for the use of our base out here. The fleet is still the biggest in the Royal Navy, some 70 ships, including one commando carrier. Ground forces total 39,500, plus another 8,000 men in Hong Kong. Air Force strength, 10,300. The total cost last year, 253 million pounds. But Britain is trying to put a ceiling on defense spending. Wouldn't it be cheaper then to do away with a naval base and operate only at sea with a floating base called a fleet train? We're halfway through a very considerable modernization of those uh, auxiliary ships which form what you call the fleet train. That's the supply element, ships which carry the stores, and the running repair element, uh, repair ships. And this enables our fleet to stay at sea and pick up all its stores, all its oil fuel, and uh, to do a certain amount of uh, not too sophisticated maintenance without relying on any sort of base at all. But those supply ships must, of course, go to a, somewhere to pick up their supplies. And they go back to what is loosely termed a base. This base here has certain elements which make it up. First of all, it's got the supply elements. It's a place where you unload your merchant ships, take out your supplies, put them together in the packets which you want, put those packets in your mobile fleet train, so that they're ready to get at and be issued when wanted. That's the most economical way of sending supplies out. That goes for ammunition, oil, food, spares of all sorts, nuts, bolts, cotton waste, buckets, anything you like to think of. As well as that, there is this maintenance and repair side of the base. Maintenance of ships is done by sailors, but repair, which is something bigger, and that has to be done in some sort of base, and that base has got a dockyard. Most of the local labor employed on the British bases in the Far East is centered on Singapore. 40,000 are directly employed, another 10,000 work in one way or another for service families. This is just under 10% of the working population of Singapore. Service spending is about one-fifth of the island's gross national product. Since Singapore's expulsion from Malaysia, the Malaysian government has been slowly and deliberately cutting the island off from its traditional trade with the Malayan Peninsula. Half the Singapore population is under 21. New investment is not coming in fast enough to provide work. Political unrest is always just beneath the surface in Singapore. Severe unemployment would undermine the present government. Any sudden reduction in service expenditure could be disastrous. Ships are very crowded. When you live on board, there's very small chance for exercise. And when the men come in, they've got to be able to have their clubs, their swimming bath, their places where they can live when their ships have the air conditioning she stripped down for maintenance, uh, and generally where they can have a relaxation and a refurbish ready to go on to the job. East of Suez is not merely manpower, it's families as well. There are 35,000 wives and children in Singapore, a total of 42,250 throughout the area. They have their own clubs, their own housing, their own schools and hospitals. Well, that is, is a base. Now you must have that somewhere. You must send your fleet train, your supply ships back to pick up their stores somewhere. The question is where? Now, we do it here in Singapore, but supposing it was 8,000 miles away, then if you had to do all that, 
that you have to send back for your supplies and bring them out, send your ship back for repairs and bring them back again, I think it's easy to see that the problem is highly uneconomical. Gurkha paratroops launch an exercise on the Malayan Peninsula. The Gurkhas are Britain's foreign legion. They've served us bravely and faithfully for over a century. Now their brigade is to feel the economic squeeze, and the Gurkha's strength is to be run down by a third. The ending of confrontation has also permitted a withdrawal of combat and support troops to Britain. The total strength of Far East Command is now back to its old pre-confrontation level of 54,050. Efforts are being made to trim this still further, but this would require political as well as economic decisions since Britain is bound by treaty obligations to her Commonwealth partners and allies. Britain has already invested more than 400 million pounds in bases, airfields and facilities in Singapore and Malaysia. Do we now have the strength to influence events in the most troubled corner of the world? General Carver explains. I'm not expected to be self-sufficient in terms of numbers of soldiers on the light scales of equipment who can be deployed to meet a, a long-standing emergency which blows up. Uh, but but that, that is why uh, we retain the ability to fly troops out here in order to provide that additional reserve. If we kept no troops out here at all, but just the uh, ability to employ them when they came, we should have to have much bigger and more ex uh, extensive base facilities. We would have to have all the equipment out here that couldn't be got here quickly. Uh, we would have to turn it over and keep it in good trim. And those troops would have to have another complete set of equipment to train on elsewhere, and in every place where they might be wanted, you would have to have an equal reserve. So this is, in fact, a very expensive way of doing it. Therefore, we've got to keep intact uh, all those things which enable us to handle reinforcements which come from home or from elsewhere and deploy them extremely quickly. So that it depends very much what actual type of base installation or troops is reduced uh, when it comes to saying how it affects my efficiency to react to whatever I may be told to do. The British bases in Singapore cover 36 square miles. That's one-tenth of the entire island. The main army depots alone cover 30 acres. They stock everything from field guns to bootlaces. Isn't it wasteful to maintain such lavish installations? Well, it all depends what you call wasteful. I'm not quite sure whose money you think is being wasted. If you suggest it's the taxpayer, don't forget we're taxpayers too. Uh, this is, in fact, a very complicated calculation. It's not just a question of how much money is actually spent on the defence vote uh, here in Singapore. The soldiers themselves have got to be paid wherever they are. Uh, they've got to be trained wherever they are. They've got to be equipped wherever they are. But the cost is high. Expenditure last year in Singapore ran to £128 million for equipment, 85 million pounds for personnel and 11 million pounds for buildings. An infantry battalion costs 30 percent more to maintain than in Germany and 60 percent more than in Britain. In Singapore, welfare alone costs nine million pounds. Much of this goes on service families. Staff Sergeant Tony Tomlins came out to Singapore a year ago with his wife and five children. They've spent most of their married life abroad. To them, Singapore is just another posting. Not as enjoyable as Germany, but better than Cyprus or Aden. Here, at least, you can get help with the housework. A Chinese armour can earn about one pound a week for looking after the ironing, the cleaning, and sometimes the children. Most wives prefer to do some of the housework themselves, but are free enough to enjoy Singapore's year-round summer. Sergeant Tomlins works in one of the big army depots. His house is provided by the army. Each day, he drives 12 miles to work in his second-hand car. Mrs. Tomlins finds a lot of the shopping cheaper than at home. Food is certainly cheaper, so are clothes. Almost everything is available, often on credit, though most foods are frozen or tinned. Consumer goods like cameras and transistors are considerably cheaper than in Britain. Most service families soon own slide projectors and record players. They also reckon on saving a good bank balance, ready for the return home. Section on target, bearing three 
A war out here is dictated very largely, given the Air Force side, by the climate and the country. And you do need specialist equipment, and you're usually fighting a comparatively unsophisticated enemy. So the equipment that we have got is suitable for that type of war. But, of course, one needs a deterrent, so that if the enemy were to consider escalating the war, then he knows that we would be in a position to give him a bloody nose, so he doesn't try it on. Any military vocabulary, as it were, is bound to have uh, some items which are brand new, some which are aging, and some that are aged. Um, and ours is exactly the same as anybody else's. We have got some new aeroplanes, and we've also got some very old aeroplanes. It doesn't follow, of course, that an old aeroplane can't do the job, but equally a new one is more likely to do it better. Uh, we are approaching a period, a pre-planned period, of re-equipment of most of our aircraft, and I'm quite happy that the aircraft we have got now will last as long as they are planned to last, which, of course, is not forever. And when we ask for new equipment, whether it's a radio equipment or an aircraft now, it is written into the requirement that it must not involve an awful lot of men or an awful lot of man hours to keep it going. In other words, we are going for simplicity. So the aircraft themselves are liable to be very much more expensive, but the cost-effectiveness of them shouldn't be any more. In fact, we should, by good man management techniques and good technical techniques, be able to reduce the cost overall for the same result. Does this apply to the air bases themselves? We, I think, now have powered them down to a maximum efficiency for a minimum cost. There are a number of things that are done in this direction. For example, the em employment of the maximum of local labor. Uh, where a job can be done by one of the local people efficiently, as very many of them are, then we employ him because he costs us less in travel costs and this sort of thing. And this is a constant process of reducing them to the maximum effectiveness to go with minimum expenditure, and I think we're doing a good job in this connection. The delta-winged Javelin all-weather fighter is the main RAF defense weapon. It's subsonic and armed with four Fire Street guided missiles. This squadron is half an hour's flight from Vietnam. Their potential opponents, until six months ago, were supersonic Russian-built MiGs of the Indonesian Air Force. They often sighted each other, but no one pressed the trigger. Much quieter now. We still have an aircraft, as before, on readiness all the time to interrogate or identify any unknown tracks coming into West Malaysia or Singapore. But apart from that, the tension has gone from flying. We were together with the strike forces here. We felt that we were the reason that the enemy weren't coming in to interfere with the supply drops, which are the only way of providing our troops with food and ammunition. But certainly the tension has gone. Britain continue east of Suez if present economies continue? Well, if you mean keep the peace in the Far East on our own, I'd say no, but we've never said we would do that, you know. We've always made it very clear that uh, we're here to uh, contribute towards stability uh, in conjunction with our allies, on, on an allied basis, uh, and that is the point. 
So I, I don't think the present trends toward economy will in any way detract from our being able to do that. You may think perhaps that uh, our contribution to the, uh, to the Allied kitty, if you like, will be a little less, but that isn't necessarily so. Quite apart from our military capability, aren't there political considerations in this area which should be already setting us looking for alternative bases to those in Singapore and Malaysia? Well, I don't think so at all, uh, in, in any way. After all, as the, our government's policy has been made clear, I think, and, and many times now, that it's our intention to stay in Southeast Asia for as long as we think that uh, conditions are reasonable for us to do so. Britain would like to stay for as long as she can make a useful contribution. And if the pound gets firmer and Britain's economy surges forward and she can play a bigger role in uh, maintaining peace and prosperity throughout the world, including east of Suez, then she'll stay for some time. But if the pound gets, uh, comes under heavy pressure and unexpected problems arise, well, I think we might think in terms of a decade or even less. It is in the interest of Britain to maintain the large-scale force here because the British has got one of the biggest uh, economic interests in this country, with British capital invested uh, in, in most fields, in tin, in rubber, in iron, in everything that you can think of. They are reported to have between 400 to 500 million pounds investments in the whole of Malaya. And if they were to take away only 10% of these interests or profits, that would amount to at least 50 million pounds sterling every year. But they can't escape from that charge, because it's quite clear. Otherwise, they got no particular love for us in order uh, to defend us. Uh, it is uh, because of their property, their investment here, that they are here. They are also here to help the Americans to protect their interests and to uh, go along with the silly game of containing China and containing communism. No, no, I don't think that's right uh, at all. Our, our purpose here is a far wider one. It is in conjunction with our allies to make our contribution towards the stability of the whole of this part of the world and by thus doing to allow the communities here to prosper, increase their standards of life and thus in themselves become a bastion to the ever-threatening spread of communism, Chinese communism. This is where Vietnam is so important. If you don't escalate and don't run into a, a really major war and you can really hold the line, then I think you give hope for the rest of South and Southeast Asia that the world need not go communist, that it is not inevitable. And then uh, I think Britain has a very important role to play in that not only can she help keep temperatures down amongst the lesser contenders for uh, the prize once the European powers have removed themselves from South and Southeast Asia. You can also, I think, help in a very constructive way to make countries begin to think in terms of building up what they've got. They're not grabbing what the other chap has got. As far as Malaya is concerned, I think the British will be driven out and once we have a genuinely independent democratic Malaya, the people will be able to look after themselves and we do not think in terms of uh, military presence or uh, serving somebody's cat's paw as a strategic base. We look after ourselves and we hope to be able to cooperate with all the countries around and live in peace and harmony. That is what we hope for. That will mean the complete defeat of US imperialism in the whole region. The same argument about Britain's continuing presence east of Suez also rages in and out of Parliament. There's been increasing pressure to cut back defence expenditure, particularly in Asia. And now that Indonesia no longer threatens Malaysia, critics of Britain's defence policy have been able to argue that such a distant and expensive commitment is too heavy for Britain to bear. But trouble can still be expected from this region. Confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia has given way to a new and growing confrontation between the Malay inhabitants of Southeast Asia and the immigrant Chinese. Britain's future role east of Suez may yet be keeping these two communities from each other's throat.